Mr. Frank Thierry. Woo! Uh, currently working on, uh, on the Harley Quinn book. And uh, someone who should need no introduction, Mr. Marv Wolfman. Woo! Some uh, small comics you might have heard of. Uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, Teen got Titans. That. Got that. Two Dracula Blade. Co-creator of Bullseye, oh, yeah. and uh, currently available, his novelization of Suicide Squad, the movie. So cool. kind of cool. <laughs> to his left, your right, wonderful actress, writer, creator, Amanda Diver, Wonder Woman 77. <laughs> Also, uh, can be found in other great comics, uh, Womanthology, and uh, if you have Hulu, she's got uh, many writing credits on there, and uh, it's honored to have her here today. Thank you. And uh, hometown hero, favorite of mine, Maine Doyle. Woo! Recently of uh, Constantine Hellblazer, and also you know her for her fabulous art on Mara, and Fantastic Four 600, and The Kitchen from Vertigo, and uh, lots of other very, very cool projects. So uh, welcome everybody, thanks for, thanks for coming here. Now, um, so this is a, this is a writer-centric panel, and, uh, ooh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that, was the, that was the voice of Dark Side. Uh, so I, I wanted to just uh, start off with, um, you know, we've got a, a range of experience here. And uh, I, I have some questions, um, you know, from a writer's perspective. What has changed really recently with, um, you know, page counts are different than when it was back in the day when, um, when Marv was writing uh, like his masterworks. Uh, and now people are writing for digital comics. And, and are, you, are you guys having a... a Trouble dealing with the shift moving from uh, from longer page counts to to like a shorter, more digital story. For Just for for anyone, <laughs> okay. for anyone. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think a writer writes, and you know, you get used to. I, look, I work in different mediums too. I've done video games. I've done. Um, animation, and after a while, you get you get to learn that you know different things from, you know, different muscles for different mediums. And, uh, you know, the, the page count, at first it's 22, now it's 20, and you get used to it, you know? You, you learn that, uh, to pace yourself, you know? And yeah, Mark, you've, you've worked on uh, lots of different mediums yourself, like, you know, from, from the... Well, the page count, uh, the page count has always been weird. Um, when I started, uh, those of us who were beginning were all on one, two, and three page stories. And we had to learn how to write in that, in that very short term. When you got the full book, they were 25 page stories. Um, then at Marvel, when I was working on Tomb of Dracula, for a brief time it went down to 17 page stories. Uh, then on Teen Titans, it began at 27 pages. Now it's 20. So, you know, it's always moved all over the uh, scale and you just adapt to it. You, you have to plot differently for different sizes and uh, you just do, you do the job as necessary because the comic book has a different number of pages than a novel which is, you know, 90,000 words or whatever or a video game could be thousands of pages sure. of script. Um, so the, everything is different and you just adjust to it. Yeah, one other thing I want to add. When I first started, it used to be the old Marvel method, which I'm sure uh, Marv started, is uh, with, with just plot and not script. And now it's pretty much accepted that it's plot and script. You know? So things change and you, you adjust. Yeah, I was going to say I'm primarily a television writer, but um, writing for comic books is fun. You just you kind of adapt for the, the medium. You tell a story that fits your medium. So if you've got a you know, a 20 page story, then that's the kind of story you tell. And uh, for digital versus print, it's, that's just more, um, I guess, a pacing difference. You know, like sometimes you can't have like the full splash page, for instance, you have to do right. like a half splash or something like that. So you just kind of, you figure out where your beats are gonna be 
that's going to fit your, your medium nicely so you can tell the story the best way you can. If, if anybody has an iPad or, or something and is used to read some comics there, um, Amanda and Kat's uh, Wonder Woman Sensation Comics is, uh, it, is a, it's a short story, but it's very cool. And uh, that, that's what, basically, you're basically working with two panels mm -hmm. and, and not a big splash page. So, you know, that's, that's different when, it, when you come, they, they do reprint these things and they come out regular comic form. But you have to write it initially for, for the digital um, right. version. And, and how about Mink? You're, you're coming all the way from, from oh. being an artist, and now you're a writer. Yeah, I've only been writing officially for two or three years, so I'm still all malleable, and I've got tons of neuroplasticity, so I can just handle anything that changes <laughs> No, but it's, uh, it's actually, it's the Marvel format, but on, on Hellblades, or, uh, which I co-wrote with James Tynan IV, who's amazing. A lot of the times we did kind of do the Marvel format, because um, our artist that we were working with, Riley Rosmo, just came up with such like electric layouts that were just out of some weird nidosphere, like his own brain. So sometimes we would just, you know, break it down and be like, this this will be four or five panels, and you know, something happens in each beat. And then he would come back with us with something that conveyed the same story but had like 11 or 12 panels and we'd just be like, well, we're gonna not even attempt to script this until we see what we get back from him because it wouldn't make sense. But it, it was, I like that though because I think that, I mean obviously I haven't been writing for years or even decades or any of that, but I, my impression is that comics these days are much less of a, for by and large, of a collaborative effort. Excuse me, this is crazy. I think my mic's a little hot. That's your hot mic, okay. Um, they're much less of a collaborative effort. It's much more of an assembly line kind of a deal. You let the writer talks to the editor, the writer runs their drafts by the editor, the artist blind gets the final draft with no input on the story and pencils come back and you know, it's, it's very much doom, 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 these are the steps. And so I think that anytime you have the opportunity to collaborate with an artist more directly or a creative team if you're doing TV or video games. It's, it's obviously more enriching for all parties. And, and you bring that, uh, when, when you're writing your scripts with James, you have like another, another great mentors with Brian Wood and stuff. So, um, you know, you get to bring in your experience as an artist, like saying, oh, I'm not going to give this, this guy <laughs> like yeah. a, a big crowd and, uh, and a 25 car pile up with 100 people in the background. You would think that, except that when I'm writing, I'm like, I don't gotta draw this. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, do you feel the same, Frank? No, it's a bunch of being a writer. Yeah, yeah. Eight thousand superheroes, but whatever. I ain't born again. Knock yourself out. The fleet engages, right? And Marv, obviously, it's uh, like fortunate enough to work with George Perez. There are a bunch, so he, he can cram in as many people as he wants. Yeah. <laughs> I will say sometimes I collaborate with my spouse, and in those cases, you do have to be a little bit careful. <laughs> um, with the big stories that Kat illustrates, I'm like, honey, is it okay that there's like a thousand tiny details in this room? Because even if you say no, I'm going to do it, but I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> you have to draw the thing 8,000 dollars. <laughs> Now, uh, we're also in a time of great uh, reboots. We've got, you know, we've got our favorite heroes on TV. You know, Supergirl's coming back next season, and, and, uh, and Suicide Squad's on, on the big screen and everything. Uh, and, like, and I was just, um, you know, just today reading some recent issues of Cyborg from Mr. Wolfman here. And, uh, so how are you guys feeling about like the current market where we're, there seems to be a cycle of just just rebooting everything and realigning things? I mean, does it does it hurt you or, or help you? Like when you, you have you know, Harley Quinn, I'm sure you can't say too much, but are are you like told to realign with what's going on TV or or in the movies these days? Or I, I think the TV and the movies have they, look. I think it's affected. You know, it's only natural that it would. I mean, you see them promoting characters. Like I did, um, uh, when I did more, uh, the, which being uh, video games, I did more of Capcom 3 and 3.5. Nice. Nice. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you didn't mention that when you first did <laughs> But, but um, one of the things they were doing were promoting characters that they intended to, 
you know, like Rocket Raccoon was in there, you know, uh, Nova was in there. It's characters that they wanted to do stuff with the movies and stuff like that. And I think the same thing is with, with comics. You see, they give a character a push because it's going to appear in this television show. It's going to be in this movie. Uh, and Ultimate Spider-Man 2. And Ultimate Spider-Man 2, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think that's just part of the landscape now, and that's the way it is. Uh, that, so, uh, sort of the same uh, question just for for Marva. Like, have you seen Supergirl, and you know, what do you what do you think of Supergirl on TV? If you have, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen all of those shows, and I watch them regularly. I love Supergirl; it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of my characters is, of course, on that one, and that's Cat Grant. Um, and um, Calista Flockhart's favorite character. Cat is one of those characters. Uh, the probably of, my, of all my characters, Cat and someone you've never heard of, um, whose name I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will in a second. It's, it's Emil Hamilton. Um, That's when you create a lot of characters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I guess no, that. His, his, uh, uh, he's Sorry. a scientist. They've actually appeared in more live action of, uh, places than any of my other characters, and nobody even knows they exist. Cat, <laughs> uh, 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 her first appearance was a full season on Lois and Clark, played by Tracy Scoggins, and then she w then she was on uh, Smallville, uh, twice by two different actresses, um, and then finally, uh, uh, the, you know, Supergirl. So she's been on those, and uh, the other character, uh, Emil Hamilton, has been also on all those shows. The funniest one was on Smallville, because it was originally played by Joe Morton in like season three or four, I forget, and um, he was killed. And then, of course, a couple of years later, the staff on Smallville completely changed, and they didn't know he was even on the show, <laughs> so they brought him back. <laughs> And Joe Morton is black, and the new actor was white. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> and here's the weird part. Um, Richard Shaw from The West Wing played the character Emil Hamilton in Man of Steel. Right, right. Oh, There's a scene where he's talking to a tech in the government building or whatever. The tech played Emil Hamilton in Smallville. <laughs> <laughs> And it gets even weirder because Joe Morton played this character, who's a scientist for Star, and now he's playing Cyborg's father, who's a different scientist for Star, in uh, he, in Superman uh, and all of the future ones as well. So I love it. I mean, I, <laughs> if they play him well, uh, I've been very lucky with a lot of the characters like Deathstroke. Uh, Manu Bennett did a beautiful, beautiful job on, oh, on yeah. uh, Arrow. Uh, uh, and so many of the characters have done so beautifully uh, that you're thrilled. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, the Nova Corps, you know, uh, that's, all, that's all stuff that came out of Nova. So, you know, I love it when it's done well, or I don't even care if it's exactly what I did, but that it has the same intent. Mm. And Smallville, I mean, uh, Supergirl is doing a phenomenal job with Callista, with Callista Flockhart because they also brought in her son, Adam, and he's from the comics. Uh, so they're really paying attention to all of that stuff, and uh, they are literally making comic books look alive on TV. I mean, uh, they're, fine. they're doing it just beautifully. It's a great time we live in, and uh, many you worked for, on uh, Wonder Woman, but in the, in the vein of the Batman 66 comics that came out, the Wonder Woman 77. Yeah, it's uh, that's super fun um, to go to go retro because obviously Wonder Woman seventy seven is a continuation of the Linda Carter television series, um, so we're we're doing stories as if they were episodes, as if the series was still going on in nineteen seventy seven. So it's really fun. You get to work with things that are uh, the next story that I have that's coming out is actually a space race story. So we've got like Soviet Russia cosmonauts and. Um, Maybe Wonder Woman going into outer space and spinning into a Wonder Woman astronaut suit that's still very <laughs> 70s inspired. Possibly that definitely happens. Um, <laughs> so that's 
that's really fun because um, I've done like like you mentioned the Sensation comic, which is Wonder Woman, just in kind of a general way. But to do such a specific television-based like. I mean, obviously, Linda Carter was an awesome Wonder Woman, and I was super excited uh, to get to to write it with with her in mind and with what the show could do in mind. It was really fun. You got to direct Linda Carter in your own Wonder Woman. I mean, we can put it that way. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> She's my best friend now. In the theater of the mind. <laughs> And maybe we're sorry to hear that Constantine was canceled, but you know, oh, maybe he'll. Show? Yeah, but. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we'll see him uh, on the CW too. Well, well, for everybody too, it's like you see, you're you're dealing with these like Constantine and Hellblazer. There's people have a certain thing in their mind. About what oh that yeah. Means, right? Well, anytime you work on a on a recognized character, unless. You're Marvin, you created them. <laughs> you're gonna, you're basically, Moff created like every character. You're gonna deal with you know some sort of a kickback or the readership thinking, oh, I, I like this aspect of him yeah. more than that aspect. But it was interesting actually because when we were developing our run of Constantine, James and I, um, we actually were in a room with Brian Azzarello, who also wrote an awesome Hellblazer run. And he was giving us tips too, and we're like, oh, okay, interesting. So I like that kind of idea. It was more of like, you know, the Greek ethics where you get to like retell the same story over and over and again, except it's the, the reader or the speaker that injects their own flavor, <laughs> their own local flavor into it. So I like it. I like the modern mythology take on superhero comics, and I think that's that's what makes them very rewarding to write versus uh, creative your own original stories. It's the chance to play with iconography and with uh, just like those heroic stature figures that everyone recognizes. Like you can just throw, not that I've written Batman, <laughs> but <laughs> you can just throw Bruce Wayne up there and people are like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, orphan, tortured, I understand. <laughs> and then you can just tell new stories from there, which is why I'm, I'm baffled as to why we keep showing his poor parents getting shot. <laughs> I'm surprised that wasn't. Another thing thrown into Suicide Squad. I could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah, no, no spoilers. But there's, there's Bruce Wayne's parents are killed in Batman. Really? Uh, <laughs> are they killed in Suicide Squad? But Frank, uh, can you tell us what 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 the Gang of Harleys is all about? If people aren't that familiar with uh, with your card book, uh, it's basically. I'm leeching off for of Jimmy and Amanda right now, okay? <laughs> because, Do they know that? Yeah, of course they know. Okay. <laughs> no, but they, um, obviously, I, I'm writing a book with Jimmy, and um, it spins out of the regular Harley book. Harley's put together this gang of, uh, of various Harleys, and they, um, the, the premise of the book is Harley gets kidnapped, and the gang has to get their act together, and go and rescue Harley, and it's this character called Harley Sin, which I came up with, which I like the name. Hey. Right? Like that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clever there, yeah? So, <laughs> so um, yeah, the character's Harley Sin, so she's like a, a, you know, Harley has morphed a little bit over the years, which is not as bad. So this is more, more like, it's kind of like Harley's Joker. Um, so, so that's going on right now, and uh, yeah, pick it up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Why let more with the more copy? <laughs> what's what's your table number again? C eight oh two. I have books for sale and everything. Um, we've uh, you're recently on uh, on Cyborg, so you're still a very active uh, writer with the Suicide Squad. And uh, how was it re revisiting the Cyborg solo series? That's a because I was only going to be doing three issues, and the first one had to wrap up the previous writer's story, which was very strange because I had no idea where he was going with it. Has that to, happened to you before? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I have to. You know, the writer leaves and they don't tell anybody what they're planning for the final issue, so you have the next person comes in and has to analyze everything they wrote and try to figure out a logical ending that will still surprise people. So uh, the middle one of the three I, re I think is one of my better stories. I'm really, really proud of it because it's an entire issue where Cyborg literally can do nothing. 
he's inside a machine being repaired, he, uh, tuned up, and he has to solve all these major problems without ever leaving anywhere. And uh, so I, I sort of in the in the matrix in the cloud. Yeah, it's know. yeah exactly. And uh, I like stories that force the character to have to think because we don't do enough thinking in comics anymore. Hey. Um, <laughs> and right, but right now I'm far more interested in the fact that Raven, I'm doing a six part Raven story. Uh, the first part comes out in a, in a couple of weeks. And it's, um, and I'm on, I have three pages left of the last issue, so I'm way ahead of schedule. It'll be, all six will have been done before the first one comes out. Uh, and I'm really, really happy with that because it's a, it's a different type of exploration of Raven. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful to come back to the characters, but I love doing all that stuff. And the, the only time you want to come back to a character is if you found something brand new to say about them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just doing the same old, same old, and that's boring. So I, I found a little key in, in Raven's origin that I had never even thought of before, and um, which puts a whole twist on everything that you know about the character in many ways. That's cool, and um, and it's logical. It works. <laughs> it's not made, it, it doesn't come out of left field. It's actually was there the whole time. Well, that's that's amazing. You can discover something about something you're yeah, so thirty close years to. later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and this is a probably a is it in, in continuity rebirth. Because uh, Rebirth allows for people to, you know, honor the history of all the DC comics as well as just be like, here you go, here's here's Raven, check it out. If you don't, well, when Raven. I started it, it wasn't under Rebirth, but they, but I guess they feel that I've made enough changes that it fits under the new thing. I have no, I, I have to be honest, I have no idea beyond what you guys know of Rebirth, but they, I think they're putting the Rebirth logo on it because it it is a begin, it is a new beginning. She's younger. And I sort of think of it as she got, if you know the Teen Titans comic at all, she's the one who put together the group. But I'm saying that maybe she arrived a year before to learn everything about Earth. But that's not the, that's not the surprise thing that I came up with. That's sort of my attitude, even though she's still in the Teen Titans and all that sort of stuff, because it had to fit in current continuity. But psychologically, that's where she is, because she's younger. Um, you know, it's fun. I, I, again, when you can come up with something new, you don't want to repeat yourself endlessly. You know, uh, you have to always come up with new things, otherwise why bother doing it? It's just the paycheck, and that's not fun to write for. And, uh, do you, do you have any projects coming out, um, Amanda? I know you're probably very busy right now, but... <laughs> um, yeah, comic book-wise, besides I've got some more Wonder Woman's Sunny stuff coming up, and also I did a really fun, really messed up horror story for uh, John Carpenter's Tales of the Halloween Night, which is going to be out in September. Um, and my wife, Kat Staggs, illustrated that, and it's probably some of the darkest, most graphic violent stuff she's ever drawn. <laughs> so, what a nice gift. Yeah, I know. Like, here you go. Lots of murder. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. And Ming, what, what do you have on the on the table? What's coming up for you? Uh, I just wrapped up, and it's still coming out. It's a four issue uh, mini series from Amazon's New Jet City imprint. Oh, very which cool. Is interesting. It's called Girl Over Paris, and it's more it's more like a YA. So I did the art on it, not the writing. It's more of a YA uh, adventure, but it's a supernatural circus romance, and they go into the catacombs of Paris and and fight Harlequin ghosts and. That's pretty fun. I enjoy that. And that's pretty much all I can mention at the moment. <laughs> is that, I, I saw that listed, is that a, is that related to Cirque du Soleil? I wish. I mean, that's <laughs> it's called Cirque American, yeah. We all have hopes. No, it's actually based on uh, this YA novelist, Gwenda Bond's series, oh, which is called Girl on a Wire. And she's actually, um, speaking of writers, she also has written the YA novelizations of Lois Lane's adventures recently. Um, I wish I could remember one of the titles, but they're they're very cute and they have very graphic covers and it's it's about teen Lois solving mysteries, doing her full name secret thing. So um, yeah, it's been interesting working with her and Kate Leth uh, adapted her story basically oh, into this uh, 
Yeah, it's been awesome working with uh, Kate too. That's a that's somebody who writes in many different formats <laughs> as well. So yeah, I don't know. I like to go where the story takes me, but I, I really hope that I can do more original fun things for myself soon. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some time. If, we, if anybody has any questions, there's a there's a mic in the middle here. Is anyone? I have a question. Actually, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Um, I'm just wondering how you write, whether you have a routine, place that you like to write, hours you like to work, just how it works for you to be in the creative process. I got kids, so no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not like one place I get to write, no. I gotta be in the basement like me, you know, writing like a rat. Just how do you write and, and how'd you get here? You know, did you, when did you know you wanted to do this, and how did you prepare yourself for it? Any of oh, I guess I saw it. Uh, how I got here, I started actually as an intern for Marvel. Um, and then eventually I was on staff at Marvel. Um, I worked for Marvel.com, and uh, I was actually doing artwork for Marvel.com. I actually went to art school, believe it or not. And um, they, it turns out they needed more of my writing than my art. And I was writing and I was submitting stuff, uh, pictures and stuff like that while I was on staff, which they don't let you do anymore. <laughs> and um, I got uh, to write co Iron Man, co co write Iron Man with Joe Casada, and I took over the book when he left, and then I was writing Wolverine, and then things took off from there. Uh, as far as how I do uh, my process, basically, if I have a, a comic, I'll Letter it, I'll do it, I mean, I'll do it, I'll number it from one to 20, you know, if it's 20 pages, and, and write, on this page this happens, this page that happens. I just keep breaking things down. Mm -hmm. Then you go, but each page, okay, uh, you know, and you break it down further with the panels. But that's basically my, uh, my methodology. Uh, I actually change the way I work uh, every couple of years um, uh, on purpose so I don't get uh, um, stale. And right now, the way I've been working is I have an overview concept of the story that I've spent some time putting together. My strength, as far as I'm concerned, is structure, uh, much more than my dialogue. I wish dialogue was stronger, but uh, my structure, I think, is very strong. And I work it until, it's hap until it works. I break it down page by page, approximately. But then I write all the dialogue. No panel descriptions, no, no panels. What I want is a flow of dialogue as opposed to a flow of, of uh, pictures and uh, make sure that the dialogue sounds a little bit more natural and such. Once the dialogue is done, then I go in and place, put in uh, the, pa uh, the actual scenes for each panel. Um, because I've done it enough, I, I know where the, I know the dialogue may sound weird if you're just reading a page without knowing the context, but I know the context and I'm setting up the uh, material. Um, so the idea for me, at least, is to keep myself fresh and to uh, center on something that I feel a little bit weaker on, which is the dialogue fashion. So when you write page one, panel one, and then you write your scene description, and then you write the dialogue, then panel two, and you write the scene, to me that breaks up the dialogue and gives it a little bit stilted quality to it. And by writing the dialogue as a flowing concept, it makes it a little bit more natural for me. But the idea, again, is do what's comfortable and do what challenges you and makes the material better. And for every single person, it's going to be very different. Some people may work best at midnight, and I know a lot of people work only at night. Yeah, some people may work during the day, uh, some in drips and drabs, and some keep their little notebook or their phone on, on record and are walking in put notes in uh, as they go along, and anything that works for you is, is good. Yeah, I work, I work at night, I have a toddler, um, so I also yeah, exactly. quietly late at night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have, I have an office that's on the opposite end of the house from nursery. Um, and yeah, but I mean, if I think of something throughout the day, I might jot it down, uh, figure it out. Uh, how I got into it, I was a, I, Primarily still a television writer, I do a lot of uh, late night comedy and uh, things like that. And then, uh, as I've mentioned, I'm married to a comic book illustrator, 
we started for fun doing uh, a web comic for a comedy site together, and then um, some people started reading that, and I got asked to do Story for Women Anthology, and then um, then I did a really weird, uh, funny video that was basically a Batman joke, and uh, Chrissy Quinn at DC Comics saw it, and she'd seen some of my other uh, web comic work and whatever, but she thought it was really funny, and she was like, do you want to write a Wonder Woman story? And I was like, <laughs> Let me think about that for zero seconds. Sure, that sounds great. Uh, and then that's kind of how I started doing um, comic book work, which I actually honestly prefer even to the TV writing stuff. It's just really fun. Um, there's also not budget constraints because you can make right. anything happen <laughs> in a comic book, and as long as they can draw it, it's fine. So you can send someone to outer space or blow something up, or you know, poor artists, poor artists. Yeah, you can ask them if they draw anything. <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> I got I got into comics also kind of through fan endeavors like that you did a, mm -hmm. a video I did um I got my start doing well, I went to art school and then I got really bored <laughs> after I graduated and was like oh now I have no employment prospects so <laughs> I lived at home with my parents for a year or two uh, and I just started rewatching all the Batman the animated series and that got me like really that you know that took me to a nicer place than the place I lived in in my heart and. Um, <laughs> So I just started doing like these little short web comics where I would be like, you know, I know I talked about Batman's parents getting shot too much, but I was like, Martha Wayne, what was she like before she married uh, Thomas Wayne? And then I like would make these six or seven page fan comics all from Martha's point of view, like, I don't want to marry this guy, my dad did this for a corporate merger or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I would draw them and everything and put them on my live journal. <laughs> and it was really funny because, uh, that's how I got like my first jobs drawing in image comics and things like that. Is because people are like, oh, I see you can draw on the internet. How about you draw this or that? And then years later, Mark Doyle, who's the Batman editor, was like, I like that fan comic you did on your live journal ten years ago. You wanna, <laughs> you wanna pitch some stories to the scene? I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Embarrassingly, yes. <laughs> And maybe it's just because I haven't written professionally for all that long yet, but I'm definitely one of those people that likes to write in the dark of the night where I feel like no one can yep. see me. All the pains in the ass is asleep. I know. <laughs> I'm my like, family, my friends. <laughs> and also I'm like, don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> no one can see what I've written. <laughs> it's also more acceptable to drink while writing late at night. So I'll have to write wine. Not saying that's what I do. <laughs> that was a great question. Anyone else have a question? Uh, come up to this uh, microphone, whatever thing you call it there. Uh, <laughs> I'm holding the microphone thing. Yeah. Go ahead. A number of you folks have written for different media as well as comics, uh, video games, uh, TV, novels. When you come up with a germ of a story, how do you decide what medium it works best for and uh, what characters it works best for? Or do you uh, need or does it help to have the assignment from a publisher, studio, I mean, we need this about this, and that's when the, the creative juice is flow. It's usually, I mean, for the times that I've written video uh, stuff outside of comics, for comics it's usually easier, to, you know, it's both. You get, hey, we'd like you to pitch on something, or you say, hey, I got an idea for, you know, Aunt May, I want to write an Aunt May comic for some crazy reason. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like, uh, you know, a pitch? So, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's all like that. But video games and TV, it's more like, it's more likely they come to you, you know what I mean? Um, with, hey, we want you to write, you know, and when, when they, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, when I wrote, I wrote an episode of that, they, they came to me and basically said, okay, you're gonna tell Dr. Octopus's origin, okay? So, okay, I'm gonna tell Dr. Octopus's origin, you know what I mean? That's, uh, and you had to build a story around that. And, you know, in TV and video games, it's a lot different process than with, comics because you're working with there's more chefs in there you know what i mean i guess you know you do a comic book script and you'll get you know the editor will have maybe a couple of notes you could do a, a, an animation script there's notes all over the joint i mean it's like crazy so you know and luckily i worked with the man of action guys with joe kelly and he'll, he was like okay these notes you have to pay attention to these months eh, not so much you know um but it's all it's all the different processes and you know like we said earlier with you know, you, you learn to adapt your writing style to, to fit whatever medium you're working for. Yeah, um, 
you don't really have a choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just you really you know, work. when you're writing a video game, and I've written about a dozen of them uh, uh, over the years, um, you're working with a team of maybe a hundred people, yeah, right. all of whom are working on technical material that will either allow you to write what you think you're going to do or not, and it's constant revision based on the success of the technical side of things. So, uh, I, uh, my last one was, that came out was the uh, Epic Mickey 2, and we, we had a very good budget on that. We could do all sorts of weird stuff. But prior to that, the previous one was uh, Green Lantern, and that had to be ready for the movie and everything else, even though we weren't qu uh, quite doing the movie. We were doing a, 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 an actual, uh, what happens afterwards. And that was constantly, I submit, them to, uh, submit the script, and then they discover a day later that that technically is impossible, that they asked for, the stuff they wanted, and so I have to redo it completely. So uh, those things are not really up to you. Uh, the Suicide Squad novel that just came out uh, three days ago, um, I finished in January, and then there were reshoots, so I rewrote a whole uh, chunks in May. You know, uh, that's the way it is. In comics, uh, it's pretty, the reason I think everyone may hear on this panel, and I could be wrong, so if I'm not speaking for you, don't say anything. <laughs> uh, the reason that we love it is because we pretty much get exactly what our vision is up, up there on the panels, and that means it's purely us. And everything else is trying to make other people's work work the best because you're part of a team it, and the, there's no I in team, I guess. Uh, whatever that cliche is. It can be if you want to spell it. Yeah, uh, I think the letters could work. There's a me. Yeah, there's <laughs> always an M and an E. But not an I, you know. Uh, at any rate, uh, you're working to make uh, to make everybody's life work better in video games and animation. You're working for other things, and I've written tons of animation. Um, so it's not what people assume. Uh, Everyone assumes, and I'm sorry for speaking so long, that they can write to me and say, we, w we don't like this on the Teen Titans cartoon show, can you change it? Uh, uh, I don't even know who's in charge of the show. I'm sorry, you know. uh, yeah, I created them, but that was like 35 years ago. Uh, those guys weren't even born when I wrote it. Yeah, I, I have a question uh, regarding the, your your rewrite of the Suicide Squad novels. I'm Just, not revealing anything. <laughs> I'm a non-disclosure. <laughs> but I, well, if you if you can or you can't, just just say no. But do, do you just get the script or you get the do you get the movie to watch when you? Oh no, no, the, mo the, the movie probably wasn't uh, finished editing until after I finished writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Those things go to the very last minute mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, no, so you never see the film. If you're lucky, when I did the Dark Knight video game, um, which never came out, but uh, I did write it, um, uh, they showed me some dailies, because I really needed to hear how the Joker spoke. Mm -hmm. Seeing it in a script form wasn't enough, because I, you could tell in the writing that he was going to do something with his voice. So I had them, and they very kindly, because they certainly didn't have to do it, uh, played a whole bunch of dailies for me, so oh, I, so I could just absorb uh, what Heath Ledger was doing in, in the in the dialogue. Uh, but no, we don't we don't generally get anything. We don't generally even get the script anymore. Uh, I insist wow. upon it. I'll walk. I have no interest. You know, there's no amount of money that could get me to remember one page, let alone 125 <laughs> pages. You know, I just can't do it. So I, I insist upon a version of the script. Mm -hmm. And what usually they do today, as opposed to give you anything, is they give you a computer file that literally, if you take your cursor off the, that screen, it, it blurs. So you, you can't wow. copy it, you can't make, you know, there's a million levels of security on this stuff. You can't even look at it unless you're on that cursor. Uh, so um, uh, I'm lucky because I will walk. I just don't want to do it otherwise. I need the script in front of me. Mm. Uh, some people can't do that and have to write extensive notes. And, and I don't think that's for the best of the project uh, because you can't get into it. And you can't honor the, what the filmmaker wants 
because there may be a nuance that, that he wrote in the script. You know, David Ayers wrote both the movie and directed it, so he knew exactly what he right. wanted for that. Um, so. Well, I was always very curious about that. I was like, are they working blind here, or <laughs> what do they have to? Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Maybe if somebody else has one other question, a quick one. Yeah, he had his hand up oh, constantly. Please, 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 please. I'll be quick. <laughs> but we uh, won't be. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe. Um, actually, my question is for you. Uh, my reintroduction to comic books was actually uh, Wolverine: Law of the Jungle. Um, was there Great a book? It was. Thank you. Uh, my question was: Did you enjoy the fact that there were no real super beings in the in the comic? Was it more fun writing it just Wolverine just being, you know, him on his day off? Yes, that that was basically the intent there. Uh, when we were writing Wolverine, with, uh, when I was writing Wolverine with Sean, our Basic intent was okay. The X Men is his job. This is and our book was kind of like his, you know, off days. And his off days is what's killing a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and especially that that arc, Lord of Jungle is a mo is Wolverine. You know, we have never really seen Wolverine take on the mob, and you know, obviously, you know, uh, me and the mob, you know, kind of work well together. So, <laughs> so we kind of um, wanted to do that, but that was really. You know, that, that was my actual, um, when Axel came on to um, uh, be the editor on that. And um, we, if you remember the first issue, we have a, uh, a play with, um, they're in a bar, and it's, yeah. you see some Three Stooges, actually, that, uh, that Wolverine winds up killing. So, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of fun that, uh, that arc, yeah. Very cool. Well, once again, welcome to Boston Comic Con. Thank you. Let's get a big round of applause. And uh, be sure to get a lot of books, but more importantly, go visit them at their tables, say hi, say I was at the panel, and buy lots of stuff from them. Yeah, buy lots of stuff. Thank you guys so much.